And we begin tonight with Jim Jordan's subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government. Remember that? Jordan vowed that the committee will bring the receipts on the supposed deep state war against Trump and conservatives, complete with a slew of whistleblowers and their damning insider evidence of FBI abuse targeting Republicans while exposing the Justice Department as corruptly plotting to bring down Trump and his allies. Well, turns out he could have put that on a sandwich because it was a bunch of baloney. Last week, a 300-page report from Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee detailed what actually went down when the first three, quote, whistleblowers testified privately before the subcommittee. And spoiler alert, they aren't actually whistleblowers. They were actually just a trio of angry former FBI officials who did not present any actual evidence of wrongdoing at the DOJ or the FBI. Instead, these witnesses each endorsed an alarming series of conspiracy theories related to the January 6th Capitol attack, the COVID vaccine, and the validity of the 2020 election. But the real kicker, the real kicker is that two of these so-called whistleblowers confirmed in their testimony that they received financial support from a Trump ally of, you guessed it, from, an, from a top ally, I should say, of Donald Trump, a guy by the name of Cash Patel. The whole thing turned out to be such a sham, even Fox News was mocking it. But the sad reality is none of that will probably matter to most Republican voters and Fox viewers. It likely won't change anything for them because the Republicans who were clamoring for this committee in the first place weren't doing so because they were eager to hear facts. They just want to hear the conspiracies that they already believe in repeated back to them. They want their, their beliefs, what they believe in their gut. They want to believe that it has some sort of official backing. Even if it's clearly thin and ridiculous and just a patina of legitimacy, they want it. And that's not only what Jim Jordan is doing here, but it's what the Republican Party, specifically their disgraced leader, Donald Trump, has been doing for years. He actually understands his people. It's why, if you'll recall, after the 2020 election, Trump wanted the DOJ to just say the election was corrupt. They, they didn't have to prove it. He knew there was no proof because it actually wasn't true. He just needed them to say it. Same thing with Ukraine. The reason Trump was impeached the first time was because he tried to extort President Zelensky to just say that Ukraine was investigating the Bidens. Literally, just muddy the waters and make Biden seem vaguely criminal. Trump understands that his base doesn't care about reality. Reality is often painful and disappointing for them. They care about feelings. They want to hear that their gut feelings are right. They want their beliefs to be validated. And we've seen how they can get when their feelings aren't validated. The leadership of Fox News knows this, too. It's how they wound up in this Dominion lawsuit. The New York Times reported over the weekend about the panic that ensued within the company in the days following the 2020 election, when they were the first network to accurately call the state of Arizona for Joe Biden. Now, typically for news networks, being the first to call a state is seen as a big accomplishment. But Fox didn't see it that way. Peter Baker writes that the Monday after the election, several executives convened a Zoom meeting discussing, quote, how to keep from angering the network's conservative audience again by calling an election for a Democrat before the competition. Maybe, the Fox News mused, the executives mused, they should abandon the sophisticated new election projecting system and revert to the slower, less accurate model. Or maybe they should base calls not solely on numbers, but on how viewers might react. Or maybe they should just delay the calls, even if they were right, to keep the audience in suspense and boost viewership. Fox's Brett Baer and Martha McCallum, the supposed real journalists over there, even suggested that it was not enough to call a state based on numerical calculations, the standard by which networks have made those determinations for generations. Instead, viewer reaction should be considered. In a Trump environment, McCollum said, the game is just very, very different. See, it isn't about accuracy on the right. It isn't about facts. It's about telling people what they want to hear, even if it's false or just straight up dangerous, which begs the question, how do you get to the truth when there is such a large section of the population that not only doesn't care, they don't want it? And joining me now is Mehdi Hassan, host of the Mehdi Hassan Show here on MSNBC and Peacock, and author of the new book, Win Every Argument, The Art of Debating, Persuading, and Public Speaking. And here he is, and I have my copy right here, Mehdi. When I see you next, I have to get a signature for, from you on it. But I, I, would, I, would love for you to, I would love for you to just get into that, because 
Like, here's the challenge that I see for people who are in the communications business, you know, yeah. on our side, I guess, is that there is a whole wing of the party for whom the dealers and the buyers are now the same people, right? The Congress members who've been elected already believe in the conspiracy theories. And so they get into Congress to prove the conspiracy theories are true. And when they don't, the people that they serve don't care because they just heard it on TV and that's all they care about. You wrote a whole book about win every argument. How do you win that argument? Yeah, it's very difficult. I was on a, a call-in show earlier today and someone was asking about, you know, what do you do with your MAGA uncle at the Thanksgiving table? How do you argue with them? And I said, you can win the argument on the night. I can give you a bunch of tips as to what facts to bring, what emotions to use, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is we live in this environment where Bernie Sanders can go on Fox or Pete Buttigieg can go on Fox and liberals say, what a great argument they made. But yeah. that doesn't cancel out the next five nights of Tucker Hannity just undoing it all. When you have a constant media diet of lies and propaganda, which these people are kind of injecting into their veins every night, and we now know that the hosts, well, we already knew, but now we can prove that the hosts don't even yeah. believe the nonsense they're saying to their viewers. By the way, Joy, you and I are often accused of having contempt or disrespect for the conservative voters. No one has more contempt or disrespect for conservative voters than conservative media personalities, by the way. That's but right. look, how do you stop that when you have nonstop lies? I don't have the silver bullet. It's very hard when 20 to 30 percent of the American public has been cocooned off in a bubble where they are fed misinformation, disinformation by the likes of Ingram and Hannity and Rupert Murdoch who goes under yeah. oath in a deposition and says, yeah, my hosts endorsed the big lie. Yeah, you know, I don't believe in it. But by the way, according to the reporting, Murdoch hands over secret Democratic Party ads and uh, that haven't aired yet to Jared Kushner. He gives debate strategy to Kushner. In any other news organization, heads would roll. But Fox is not a news organization. So no heads have to roll. There is no controversy. That's why I refuse to call it Fox News. It's Fox. It's yeah. not a journalistic enterprise. Well, I mean, the thing about it is I think the smartest thing that they ever did from the purposes of brand is to put the word news at the end, right? That is the thing that sort of makes the whole game work. And and, and I, I think a lot about, you know, I used to every so often just tune into Rush Limbaugh because I wanted to hear what he was saying. And what he would do is he would give the, 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 the wildest beliefs of his base, which are white working class people for the most part. He would say to them that it's really not the rich. It's really not, you know, um, the system. It's really... The blacks, it's the feminazis, it's the women. They're against you. They're trying to hurt you, right? And that was very powerful because it was a feelings message. It didn't need any facts. Exactly. Fox News took that same brand and put the word news at the end of it. Like, there, there's almost nothing more powerful than that. And Jim Jordan's doing the same thing. He puts this thing called committee. And committee is saying, look, my yeah. wild belief system has a committee investigating it, it must be real. I, I really don't know how you overcome that when a good third of the popul of the adult population is immersed in that day in and day out. So I would say two things. Number one, uh, we've got to stop legitimizing this stuff as news. And I, I've said for a while, I agree with Senator Elizabeth Warren, that Democrats shouldn't be going on this channel, shouldn't be treating it as a news organization. I was glad to see Joe Biden refuse to do the Super Bowl interview with Brett Bayer, Brett Bayer, straight <laughs> news Brett Bayer, who, according to New York Times reporting on Saturday, was saying in private, hey, let's not just trust the numbers. We need an extra layer when we decide our election result. What's the extra layer? Whether Trump agrees? That's the straight right. news host. So I'm glad Joe Biden did what Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and others have refused to do. He said, no, I'm not, play I'm not going to play this game. Democrats need to pursue that. We have to make the point that this is a propaganda organization, not a news organization. And the second point I'd make is to jump on what you just said a moment ago, that they have the emotion, right? One of the things I say in the book, chapter two of the book, liberals, progressives, the left, they kind of handed over the emotional battlefield to the right. Progressives, liberals, Democrats always want to win an argument with one more statistic, one more fact. Just give yeah. me time for one more Pew poll or peer-reviewed paper, and I'll change <laughs> people's minds. That's not how it works. Voters don't operate no. on that basis. You've got to get to them emotionally. You've got to win the battle for emotions. You've got to inspire people, rouse people, show some passion. That's what Democrats need to be doing to fight back against the emotional em energy, the demagoguery on the right. Yeah, let me read a little bit from your book. It says here, um, this is from your book, Donald Trump is probably unaware that he's an avid practitioner of a debating method known among philosophers and, rhetoric and, and rhetoric rhetoricians as the gish gallop. Its aim is simple, to defeat one's opponent by burying them in a torrent of incorrect, irrelevant, 
or idiotic arguments. As one pithy tweet known as uh, Brandolini's Law put it, the amount of energy needed to refute BS is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. The Gish Galloper's entire strategy rests on exploiting this advantage. By the time you've begun preparing your rebuttal of the Galloper's first slide, they've rattled off another dozen. They want to trick the audience into believing that the facts and the evidence are on their side. And we have so many examples. I mean, the reality is you're right. It's delivery over depth. It's the proof of verbiosity. It's, and it is constant, and it is not just in this country. I mean, we have a world now in which you have a Bibi Netanyahu who's literally under indictment and able to get reelected. You have a Vladimir Putin who's just sort of overwhelming his own country with the idea that they're winning a war, that they're literally body bags are coming home. Like, this is a proven method. Trump yeah. has it. And I'm concerned that the media falls for it in part because they'll do false equivalency. They'll say, well, DeSantis yeah. is completely different from Trump. How? <laughs> He's not. Yeah. He's just doing it more aggressively. It's such a good point you make about the global angle, because Trump did inspire both a national movement. You have these mini Trumps now, as we saw in the midterms, yeah. the Carrie Lakes of this world, all following yeah. the same tactic. And you have a global movement. I, you know, Joy, before I came to MSNBC, I hosted a show on Al Jazeera English. I used to interview yeah. politicians from all over the world. And I noticed post-2016, they all started having the same Trumpian tics about fake news, about trying to bury you in nonsense lies in like 60 seconds, 10 lies. And that is the strategy that Trump does. And I say in the book, you've got to be able to pick your battle. Don't try and fight them on every train. Don't try and rebut all 100 lies. I say, don't budge. You know, we've got to ask follow-up questions. We can't let someone come on our show and just say some nonsense and we move on to the next topic. Stick around, push them, don't budge, don't move on, ask a follow-up. And the third point is you've got to call this stuff out. I give it the name, yeah. the Gish Gallop. It was invented by a creationist, this idea of overwhelming you with nonsense, to Steve Bannon flood the zone with excrement strategy. We have to call it out. We have to nail it down and say, that's what they're doing. It's propaganda. It's not good faith argument.